So purely in terms of military power, the position of the United States is fairly unassailable. But I think that's a very limited way of looking at it. There are political questions. To what extent would the American domestic population be willing to bear the burden of continuing to be this global policeman? To what extent is the rest of the world willing to accept this role as, as a global policeman? And what kinds of actions can they take about it? Here, when we're looking at the continued preponderance or military terms of the United States, we really have to move, uh, the military part of it is the easy part. The political part is where it becomes much more important. That's what I urge you all to be thinking about. What would be the political, in a sense, challenges to the continuation of this, uh, the, this order? And I want to suggest a couple. One is the states breaking apart. That is, that this, this global system that is maintained by the, the American military may not, be defeat, may not be defeated militarily, but it may simply be in, 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 impotent to maintain the kind of order that this globalization uh, is about. I want to argue that the most likely source of semi-military conflict is not between states, but within states. Uh, Martin van Krevel has written that it is the fracturation of authority that is critical in the 21st century. We have seen this process over at least two millennia, certainly in the West, of increasing aggregation of power, of increasing, uh, um, increasing control, in increased territory, increased resources. What we might be seeing in the 21st century is a shift back, a disaggregation of power, where power or military power or destructive capacity, however you want to call it, becomes in a sense much more fractured uh, less pos there's less possibility of w anyone being able to control it because it's not very clear who holds it. This is, in a sense, is a return, if you will, to a medieval politics where the monopoly of weapons uh, uh, of destruction or the means of destruction is no longer guaranteed even to the supreme uh, 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 power that we get so many challenges, in a sense, to this power that it is militarily impossible to respond to that. And let's look at the breakup of states, which is arguably, so far anyway in the 21st century, the most important uh, military or geopolitical uh, 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 trend. Let's begin with a tour of the world again. Certainly, the United States and Canada, uh, uh, despite the fears of a Quebecois separatism, etc., we don't have to worry about that. But certainly, below the border is a very different issue. Since 2006, Mexico has lost anywhere between 60,000 and some argue up to 130,000 people because of the narco wars. The capacity of the Mexican government to impose its hegemony over large parts of its own territory have been severely, severely challenged. We have even a worse situation in most of Central America, where Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador are living with a massive amount of what we might call criminal violence, or we might call, it's not non-political, because behind those criminal groups, there are often many, many uh, powerful political groups, but it is, not, it is not violence that is being exercised by a state necessarily, but by challengers to the very authority of the state. And what's interesting here, it's not challengers to the authority of the state that seek to replace that authority, but rather that want to uh, finish this process of disaggregation and remove the state as a major player. We continue with this in South America. Certainly in the case of Colombia, although the situation has changed over the last five or to 10 years, we had a serious threat to the monopoly over the means of violence uh, of the Colombian government and in still parts of the country, the Colombian government certainly does not exercise that monopoly of, of, of violence. We had a similar situation in, in Peru. And again, while that has uh, been uh, reduced, that possibility of non-control over territory uh, remains very important. In Brazil is the case that, uh, in a sense, it exemplifies this. And here we're not talking about control over massive amounts of territory, but the ability of the central government to impose its control over its own cities. 
We have large parts of South American cities and certainly uh, also Central American cities that are essentially no-go zones for large parts of the police or even uh, for, for the military. So here what we're seeing is a threat to this kind of political order that comes not from external or even internal challenges to that authority that seek to replace it, but simply from a fracturation of this power and the incapacity of any single uh, government to impose its authority on all its territory. Again, a re-feudalization, if you will. Where is this coming from? Large amounts of inequality certainly are a big part of it. Uh, low amounts of state capacity are another part of it. Uh, and this is a pattern that we're going to see throughout the developing world, where in a sense you have created societies that may not have the organic cohesion in terms of social equality or in terms of the imposition of authority that is needed to maintain uh, a, 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 a solid states. And again, remember that the major theater of war, that the Western way of war, is based on this state. Without this state, we're looking at a very different kind of conflict. How about in other parts of the world? Certainly in Africa, this has been a major element since the, the, the since independence. In fact, we, we have seen the political map be transformed because of the incapacity of some states to maintain uh, their absolute control. Whether we're talking about South Sudan or we're talking about Eritrea, for a, 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 a example, very few of the countries, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, can claim that they have true control over their, their territory. You have in, in, in many parts, certainly in the 1990s, for example, in parts of, of West Africa, a kind of extremely violent warlordism where the violence reach new levels, or at least on a personal level, if not on an aggregate uh, uh, level. But you didn't, it, what you didn't have is this kind of organized imposition of military violence, but almost a chaotic explosion of course, the most tragic, in a sense, the most extreme version of this has been what's been going on in uh, the Eastern Congo and the Great Lakes region in general, beginning with the Rwanda massacres of 1994, but arguably beginning with the whole decolonization process in the Congo in 1960, where, again, the violence, the conflict is not coming from states organizing and using this authority in order to impose themselves on others, although in the case of Rwanda, certainly after 1994, we could argue that that might be the case, but rather it's the fracturation of authority with many claimants to this kind of violence in a population and essentially left to its own devices and suffering horrifically from this kind of disorganized violence. Now, a disorganized violence that taken to an extreme can actually produce even the aggregate number of deaths that we are normally associate with a with, uh, 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 major theater war. You have as much blood being spilled, but the kind of organization, the kind of dynamics that are involved are very, very different. Let's keep going throughout the world. Now, if we look at Europe, that is unlikely. Uh, certainly in the Western part, we have separatist movements, clearly. We have some of these states coming apart. There's a possibility of, of Scotland leaving the United Kingdom. There is a continued possibility of Catalonia uh, uh, leaving Spain. We see different versions of this, for example, in, in, in Corsica versus France. We see the possible breakup of Belgium. In all of these, clearly the authority of these nation states that were produced from beginning, let's say, in the 16th century through the process of war, we could see in some ways that these states might be coming apart. But at least for now, the level of violence involved has been relatively limited. That if these states do come apart, it is likely, although there's always other possibilities, that that process of fracturation that we're seeing will take place in a much more peaceful atmosphere and perhaps held together by whatever remains of, of the EU. The situation becomes a little bit more difficult as we move east. Uh, certainly the kinds of tensions that we have seen in the Ukraine, where you could talk almost about uh, uh, two national groups, if, if you will, sharing a state, and perhaps one of them not wanting to be part of that state. Uh, you have this changing of borders and reconfiguration of states with a great deal of violence, so far in the case of Ukraine, relatively, uh, relatively uh, limited, but always the possibility that this kind of violence 
could, uh, 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 could, could, could increase. Certainly in the case of Russia, its capacity to maintain the remnants of, of the Tsarist empire, as, uh, as it were, are, you know, it, it, is, it is not a given that Russia will be able to maintain control of this. We certainly have seen in, 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 in the Chechnya region a threat to this kind of national uh, congruence, a possible refracturation of, of Russia. And there is the kind of violence that people are most, most worried about. Of course, no region has this more than the Middle East, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the, the various struggles between uh, uh, smaller groups or the very large groupings of Sunni and Shia. We're seeing the possible redrawing of these borders. As I'm speaking, people are talking about Iraq being transformed into three countries, part of which controlling Syria, maybe part of it uh, the, a Sunni land in a sense, controlling eastern Syria, uh, eastern uh, Jordan, and western Iraq. So here is the major source of violence is not going to be, again, a kind of state entering into a, a territory and trying to destroy an enemy, but a violence that stems from within, a violence that does not allow, uh, if you will, the, 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 the exercise of this monopoly of violence. Now, what I want to argue with all of these cases, and we'll come, we'll come to a few more in a, in, a, in a second, is we have to wonder about the utility of plain old military force in resolving these issues. Can you resolve these kinds of struggles, these kinds of struggles that really are about how the state is configured and who runs that state? Can you resolve these kinds of struggles militarily? The case of Syria is interesting. I would have previously said that it was not possible, but it seems that the brutality of the Assad regime, its willingness to use tactics, uh, for example, the destruction of cities from the uh, from major theater war in order to maintain at least control over the western part of, of, of Syria, indicates that if one is willing to accept the moral and ethical costs of doing that, some success can be had using military means. I would argue, however, that certainly in the case of the United States, its willingness and its capacity to use this preponderance of military power to assure some kind of, uh, of territorial control, as Assad has done in Syria, is very, very unfortunately uh, uh, unlikely. And we continue. We have, in a sense, we, we, throughout uh, the rest of, 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 of Asia, we see ethnic struggles, questions about whether groups really belong to a particular state. We certainly have it with the Pashtun and their continued efforts to at least informally create a Pashtun land that would include parts of Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan. And in Eastern India, we have a, a, a variety of secession movements. We have ethnic conflicts in Thailand. We have ethnic conflicts in Burma, in some cases created by the states themselves. We have ethnic conflicts in, 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 in China, and certainly in Indonesia, certainly in the Philippines. So in all of these cases, what the possible source of conflict is going to be is not necessarily going to be carrying a flag, is not necessarily going to be uh, singing a national anthem. What we're seeing again is this fracturation. And particularly we're seeing with groups, uh, with significant ethnic groups that did not gain in the post-World War I or post-World War II world, their own states. For the Kurds, whether it's the Tamils, or whether it's the, it's, 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 it's the Palestinians, these are large, significant communities that were not given the kind of authority associated with states and which remain fighting in order to claim that authority. I argue again, to what extent can this be resolved militarily? To what extent can military power, the raw exercise of violence, actually provide a solution to this? And I want to argue that it is very, very unlikely. Unless one, again, was willing to use levels of violence against civilians, levels of violence against societies that would be unprecedented and, I suspect, completely and unacceptable to any kind of domestic audience. This is an important point. So we have one country that has this, arguably, military hegemony. 
Yet I want to I want to say that the kinds of political problems that the that the world might face in the 21st century uh, might not be that military authority may not be relevant to resolve them. That military authority may be able to defeat any other claimant to a global power. That military authority may be able to defeat anyone else trying to penetrate that global uh, power. But can it really be used in order to assure this? Uh, the, the continuation of the state system as we have it. Can it, really be can, it, can it really be used to assure the maintenance of this kind of authority and this kind of monopoly? And the case that brings this most to mind is, of course, terrorism. Uh, terrorism strikes at the very strength of modern society. We live in a global connected world. This is a map of the airline traffic across uh, 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 across a year. Again, these maps are available in the, the site that I told you about, Mapping Globalization at Princeton. So no part of the world, in a sense, is autarkic anymore. Of course, by the way, do notice the inequality in this distribution, that if you basically talk about a global south, it is largely, uh, uh, it, it, it certainly has an unequal link with the rest of the world and with, with itself. Nevertheless, we live in this interconnected world, and terror can attack these kinds of, 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 of connection. These open borders, these technological dependence, means that the, the, the military struggle is no longer just about suppressing an enemy. It is not going to be about defeating and destroying an enemy, but policing this very complex set of links. Here's a map of shipping lanes. So any kind of assault, let's say, or terror assault on Gibraltar, the Suez, the Straits of Hormuz, the Straits of, uh, of, of Malacca, the Panama Canal, these are choke points, in a sense, in a, a, a global system, and a global system that is dependent on it continuing to function. Let me just show you the example of uh, food and, 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 and oil. Here are the major transfers of uh, cereals in the world. And we see that large parts of the world cannot feed themselves. Certainly that is the case in, in the Middle East. That is the case in, uh, uh, for Japan. That is partly the case uh, for, for Indonesia. Increasingly, it might be the case for, for, for China. So the maintenance of these kinds of flows that depend on the complexities of globalization, to what extent can the standard Western way of war, of military power, be used to assure that these continued flows? Is it really relevant for this? Is it really relevant, again, for the flow of gas and for oil, which is even more complicated uh, than, than in the case of, of food? Can military power assure that all these pipes are working? If that is the ultimate uh, 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 end of any kind of political authority in the world, how relevant is military power that we have discussed? How relevant is military might as we have discussed it? Uh, 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 how relevant is it to this new world? Now I want you to think about this. Here we have a whole set of institutions that I have argued were the nation state, citizenship, democracy in some ways, which are associated with this exercise of military might. We have a whole set of global inequalities and global structures that have been built by this, uh, this military might, certainly over the last 500 years. But now this military might may no longer be as relevant as it once was. That those who possess this military might and in whose interest perhaps the maintenance of these flows will continue may not have the capacity, may not have the domestic political will, may not have uh, uh, the, the need to impose this. So we're dealing with a world of perhaps uh, this aggregated war of perhaps, perhaps fewer aggregate deaths, although that is uh, questionable, but we're dealing with a world of perhaps greater and ever greater violence, but one in which the standard resolution for that violence, military power, may no longer be relevant.